Okay, Drupal 8 module development, Mad with Power. Um, Ted Bowman, aka Ted Bow. Uh, working on Drupal UX and REST. Um, module developer, trainer in a former life. You guys are, we would already decided, uh, working on Drupal 8, a lot of you guys already. So Mad with Power, so basically Drupal 8 changes the game from like basically going from my Game Boy Drupal 7 to virtual reality, we're living in the future of Drupal 8. Um, so today's t examples I think are powerful, new, I think they're cool, and they're kind of like hard to figure out. They're not like super hard to do, but it's hard to figure out how to do them at first. Um, so there is a GitHub uh, repo, just if you Google Tedbo GitHub, uh, there's Drupal 8 Math Power, and I just have a repo with like a bunch of modules in it, not, not each for individual modules, just sort of demo purposes. So if you want to look at the code afterwards. Um, so we're going to look at object oriented programming a little bit. Most examples are either, either they're object oriented or they benefit from it. The importance of an AIDE, look at base fields in Drupal 8, extending classes, creating condition plugins, and the importance of an IDE. Um, so an IDE and OPP in Drupal 8, um, Drupal 8 is more complicated, but things are more encapsulated. I think it's more self-documenting in a lot of ways. I feel like it's easier to learn, but most of that depends on you having a good IDE. Drupal 8 is definitely not easier to learn, if, I, I think, if, you're not, if you don't have an IDE. Um, so we're going to look at example modules, and then we'll stop and we'll demo them and look at them in PHP Storm, which is the IDE that I use. Um, like just basically you need an IDE that knows PHP, knows PHP classes, so basically you can say, oh, let me see what the parent class is, let me go directly to the interface, let me easily override a particular, uh, see what's overridable in a particular method. So let's look at base fields. So in Drupal 8, everything is a field, everything's a, pretty much everything's a field. So for example, stuff like node, authored, change, content type. Um, so content type of a particular node is an entity reference field. So all of this was, in Drupal 7, there was sort of difference between properties and fields. Um, but in Drupal 8, the things that you add are fields and the things that core adds are also fields. So advantages is that all of these base fields can now use the same widgeters and formatters that you're used to for the fields that you add. And they're also that you can configure them on the view and on the form. And you can add new base fields, and you can alter existing base fields really easily, which we'll look at today. So also, stop me if you guys have questions along the way. Um, so base field examples. Um, node author is a base field. It's an entity reference to a user. Um, and it can use all the entity reference formatters and uh, widgets. So any, any reference widget that you have uh, for a field that you would add, you can also use for the node author. Uh, it's form configurable, but it's not view configurable. So you'll see it on the manage form fields, but you won't see it on manage display by default. Um, so another example of a base field is the user roles, the roles field on users. It's an entity reference to a role. And when I figured that out in Drupal, when I was first looking at Drupal, that kind of like blew my mind that we now have references to config entities. Um, and it can use all, it can use some of the formatters and it can also use the widgets. So you could actually change it to use a different widget than it does by default. And I think we, we have an example of that in this. Um, it's not, by default, it's not configurable on the form and it's not configurable in the view. So you don't see this field on the manage form fields or the manage display, but we can change that and we'll see that today. Um, so let's look at an example module and this example module is called real author and it tracks who really wrote the content. So we're looking at a situation where you have a site that you have, let's say everybody who's involved actually has a Drupal user account but not everybody actually logs in and uses their account, say, to post their blog post. Maybe some people are, you know, upper management, they're really important, they're like, I'm not gonna bother, you know, here's my Word document, go post it on the site. But we wanna credit those people as the real author of the content. So what we're gonna do is it's gonna separate the Drupal user from the author. And it's gonna add a new base reference field, entity reference field, 
of the target type user, but we could use content. So for the whole, we could say, well, maybe the people who write the articles, who, the actual authors never actually sign in and we just have a node that represents them. So we could change the any reference if we wanted to, to be a reference to content. Um, and we're gonna remove editing and configuration of the author field. So the example here is if we're tracking the real author as an any reference, a new any reference field, our existing any reference field, we're just gonna use as the person who is currently signed in, and that's not gonna be changeable. So you can't say, I'm gonna sign in and I'm gonna say the author is um, Joe, but Ted's signing in. So do you guys understand sort of the problem space of why you would want to do this? Sort of common use case in Drupal. Uh, so uh, this module implements uh, hook, hook entity base field info. So this would be a hook where you want to add fields to a particular entity type. Um, and we're going to add a new field. That's the entity reference field I talked about. And then it also implements hook entity base field info alter. And we're going to remove access in the form to the author field. Uh, so this is where any of the fields that Drupal adds, so where I said like everything now is a field on entities, um, we have access to change things about those fields. Um, so if we look at this, uh, down at the bottom we have, oh, I can't really see that very well. Back, 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 back. At the bottom we have this real author field, it's an autocomplete, field, and I think it's also on manage. It's not on manage display for some reason. And the important thing here, though, is that it's actually on the node, I think this is the node data table. Um, so we have um, NID, VID, type, um, and we have, we can actually add fields just by doing that hook. So we're not actually doing a schema hook where we're saying we have a new field, by a new database field, we're just telling Drupal we have a new base field. We don't particularly care how it does it, but we know this would be more efficient than say like a join if you're saying, well, this is something that's driving our whole site is figuring out who the real author is. And then you do have the advantage of this being on the same table. Um, so is this object-oriented example? Not really, it uses old school hooks, but it does benefit from the fact that we have Drupal classes. And so let's look at the code and why we are still benefiting even though it's not object oriented too much. So Drupal Amendment of Power. Okay, so we will make the text a lot bigger. So we basically have an info file and we have our module file for this. How's that? Readable? Okay. So we have two hooks. We have the uh, entity base field info. And the info is where we, most info hooks like hook block info are gone in Drupal 8, but there are some new ones like the entity, entity field info one. Um, so basically we just say, okay, I'm going to create a new base field. It's an entity reference field. And then we start to do things to add setters to it or to, to call setters. Um, so the benefit of the fact that Drupal 8 is now um, object-oriented is I can figure out things that were harder in Drupal 7. Say if I didn't know what hooks to implement or what maybe a hook expected a whole big array for me to send back and I didn't really know what was in that array. I like the fact that in Drupal 8 you can just do this and should be going with options, no? It's spinning. It's spinning. Okay. 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 So, so if I didn't know what the setters were, I can just start setting set, and it's going to say, "Oh, set the cardinality." Like I probably can figure out what that is. I can set whether it's a computed field. I can set whether it uses custom storage. Whereas my I don't know, my experience with Drupal 7, it's, it's kind of like you memorize certain hooks and you know, okay, this expects this particular um, thing back in the array, but there would be hooks like hook menu where I knew the things that I knew about hook menu, but I probably didn't know everything. Um, and I found like it was really 
not as discoverable as I find Drupal 8 to be discoverable because you can do these things in your ID just sort of knows the things that you can do at that point. Any questions? Why are some yeah. elements bolded and some not? Um, can you repeat the question? Why are some elements bolded and some not? Um, it looks like they're static, or unless there aren't bolts. Static, yeah, it does look. I'm wondering if it's chainable ones that return this back? Is that it? It should be ones that are on the actual class versus the parent class. Set cardinality would, would be, a, oh, okay, all right, yeah. So the bolded ones are on the actual, and the class that we're dealing with is probably the uh, base field definition class. So base field definition probably inherits from data definition interface or something like that. So anything that's on that class is going to be bolded, and anything that we're inheriting is not bolded. I did not know that. It's a good question. Uh, do, you, do you have any? So if you, if you look in the, the arguments that you're passing to the yeah. display options, yeah. So one of them actually is is an array, which yeah. is essentially the, the issue that you were describing. Yeah. Do you have any strategy for I guess mitigating that challenge? I mean, usually what I do is I just open it up. And at this point, yeah, when you have an array, um, you just kind of have to go in here and figure it. And oftentimes, it'll point you to another uh, function that actually has this is, you know, this is where it's really detailed. So, yeah, not everything in Drupal with the ID is going to sort of give you that. You are still dealing with arrays. But um, at this point, then I would go to set display options. You know, I would find that interface and see. You know, maybe it's more detailed there, but yeah, there are some points where you just have to go to the PHP docs and and see what it expects. So, Thank you. yeah, I don't think there's a yeah, and I don't know if yeah, I don't think PHP Storm like knows those arrays. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No. Any other questions? All right. Let's make sure I didn't destroy my code in case we actually want to actual de demo it. I don't think I did. Um, all right. So, it's not OPP in it. OPP. It's not OOP in the sense that we're not making classes, but we are benefiting the but from the fact that Drupal 8 is more class oriented. Um, so, other ideas is you might add a term referenced um, directly as a base field to say to say nodes if. You have like a single value term reference that sort of drives your whole site and you want it to be more performant. Uh, maybe you want it to be different configurable. Also, maybe you want it to be on every single content type by default and that you, you shouldn't have to add it. Um, you could add a user reference to a taxonomy term that sort of signifies owners. You could add a, a date time field. We have created and we have um, we have updated, but we don't have like a f first published date. So you could add that to nodes really easily to add a, add a field that records this was first published on this date, regardless of whether it was published or unpublished. Um, uh, date time, you could also add like the user was blocked at this particular date. Or an integer an example Mike gave this morning was that you have a migration, you're migrating in content. And you have the original ID as long as Marge, uh, where it came from, as long as Migrate is still installed. But as soon as you uninstall Migrate, you lose that ID. But maybe you're super paranoid and you want to say, no matter what, I want to know the original ID for my legacy system that this came from. I don't know why I want to know it, but I just want to know it in case I ever need to know it. Any other examples of, yeah? So you can do all that just with the alter hook in the field? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to act, figure out a way to save it. Right, but yeah, you could you could say for my base field info, yep, the info base field info alter, you could add these fields onto the base table. And like that's, but that would be like a recommended way, like force a field onto to all. Or, you know. That's one way. I mean, yeah, I would say that would be the recommended way if you want to say I want a new field on all um, bundles of this particular entity Instead type. Of like click click export. Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, and Drupal 8, because basically you're like, you're not telling Drupal 8, put it on the field, you're just set, put it on the table. You're just saying, this is a base field. Drupal 8, just handle it however you want to handle it. And it happens to be that we know that it handles it that way. But it does separate you from the idea of a schema on a table uh, a little bit. Yeah? 
Well, yeah, I'm using it um, because I'm building a system where the the um, site builders or the end users can like add bundles, and I don't want them to not add important fields that they're mm -hmm. going to need on each of the bundles. So it's not a matter of like, you know, oh, it took me a couple of clicks. It's like I'm not going to be there when they're. Yeah. It's like Drupal makes assumptions out of the box, but like you're making a system that you have assumptions that, that extend what Drupal has, and these are assumptions that you want to bake in, not like bake in the idea that you should have to do it, bake in it like it should be in the system. Um, so altering fields, you could remove access to the publish date. So right now, you could take away the, the form configurable setting for a publish date, say this is not form configurable, I'm just gonna, it's just gonna record the publish date and you should never be able to actually change that. Um, you could make the roles widget configurable. So on, I forget what they use, it's like a checkbox, but maybe you you have an awesome site that has like 100 roles, probably not a good idea, but you want to auto-complete for the roles widget. Um, so you could change that. Um, any other ideas for altering base fields? Alrighty. Okay, so another example module, so show user field. So this one makes, um, Makes hidden user base fields. Should do the opposite. Viewable, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have certain fields on the user that are not viewable and actually are not also configurable in the form. So fields like roles, last login, last access. So on managed display, you don't have the ability to move those around and display them how you want. Um, so this implements, again, hook entity base field info alter, and that's actually, and changes the fields to be display configurable. Um, is it object oriented? Not really in the sense that it uses old school hooks, but it does benefit again from the fact that Drupal 8 uses classes and for the same reasons. So let's see how that looks. So basically, on the ad, on a user page now, we would have our fields last access, last login, just as any other field that we would have add that we add ourselves, and we see it here now on Manage Display. Um, so let's look at the code for that. Show user fields. Um, so we have a help hook. But basically all I'm doing is it sends me in, when I'm altering, it sends me in an array of fields, um, and I can loop through that and the other thing that's really nice to, to sort of know about at least um, PHP Storm and probably other IDEs is that if you have a variable that's coming in that you didn't tell it was a particular variable, and I think I may have done that wrong. I think this may be an earlier version of PHP. Of, this, may be, this may be wrong the way the hook's done here because I'm not type pinning this uh, fields here to what it is. But there could be cases where you're getting variables where it's not type hinted. But if you type in it here and say, hey, I know field is a base field definition, then you're gonna easily get stuff like uh, the ability to set things. So if I do it here and say field, because I said particularly what it is, it's now it has all these options. Whereas if I didn't do this, say that was wrong, it's immediately gonna not know any of these things. So type pinning it in comments tells PHP Storm like, hey, I know what type this is so that you can know what methods are on it. Um, and you also see immediately, as soon as I got that uh, type hint wrong there in the comment, uh, it does no longer knows what set display configurable means. So basically here I just have a array of fields that I want to now be configurable display configurable and I just loop through and in each one I say set display configurable true. So that when I go to the um, manage display tab, which hopefully I still have open. Oh, we may get that when I rebooted my vagrant went down. Um, so that on the manage display tab now these would all show up. Any questions? Yeah. Is there a way to get, um, to get the type there might be, I've just never found it, a way to get type engine to work for like objects that are inside an array. So let's say you have an array called like, no. I don't think so. I mean, you would you have to assign it. 
assign it to a variable. Like in, in custom code, I, I, when I was doing like custom modules or custom development for Drupal 8, I would, uh, I would do that. I would assign it to a variable because then when I inspect code, uh, it's just so much easier. It knows what it is. So if it's not like, if I'm not adding a crazy amount of verboseness to my code by just saying, okay, this is something that I'm going to want to deal with, something in that array, um, instead of just using it in that array and then, and then, um, you know, calling the methods and just knowing what they are. If I assign it to a variable, then PHP will know what it is, and also just so much easier for me, sort of going through and jumping to definitions and stuff like that. So the, the, the core answer is that it's just try and avoid objects in an array so that integrity is preserved. Yeah, but a lot of times it's not your choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stuff's sent, being sent over. Um, it's going to take my chance here to open up my Vagrant site real quick. Okay, back to the slides. Uh, so another example module, no access reference label. So the idea here is that this allows you to view reference entity labels without entity view access. So why would you want to do that? Actually, Core already does this. It just only does it with authors. So if you notice that if you are looking at a um, node and you do not have the ability to view the author, you can still view the name of the author. So it'll say admin, but it's not linked. But for any other entity reference field in Core, it doesn't do that. So if I I'm referencing three articles, but I can only, the current viewer can only actually view one, you actually only see one of those as the field value. Whereas for any reference, a user author is also in any reference, but we behave, have behaved that differently. So maybe we actually want that to behave the same way. So that's all it does is makes these, so the links that are viewable by the user, it makes them links, but for the other ones it just makes them labels without links. Um, so it acts like the author label for other references. Um, no hooks. So what it does is, so here's an example we have our links content down here which is an any reference field and this first uh, link here is an entity that I can view. The second one, you cannot view me, is the title of an article that I cannot view. So I can still see that it's there, I just actually can't link to it. So it would also be pretty easy, like maybe you have all of the articles that you can't link, link to like a premium sign up page or whatever. Um, so is it object oriented? Yes, it's object oriented. We create a new plugin and I'm calling it no access entity reference label formatter that extends entity reference label formatter and it's just gonna override two methods. So let's take a look at that. And this is that okay. So under source plugin field field formatter, let's make this code bigger. So we have we're extending. So basically, I see that in a lot of cases in Drupal eight, if there is a formatter or widget that you think, well, this does almost everything I want but I want it to act, behave a little bit differently, you can just take that class, figure out what that class is, and just extend it. And then maybe if it doesn't make sense to extend it, you can see, you know, what does that, um, what does that class extend, and then maybe I'll extend its parent. So for this one, um, so here, I don't know why I put the check access because I'm just doing the parent, so that doesn't actually need to be there. Um, I'm just overriding the view elements. And so the parent, what the parent would actually do is it says, okay, do you have access to this? If you don't have access, we're gonna take that away from the view. But what I'm doing is say, okay, do you have access? If you don't have access, let's just make it plain text. If it does have access, let's make it actually um, viewable as a link. So I'm not gonna go through all the code, but that's the idea is what I would do is I would go to the parent probably just copy the parent completely, the, the particular method that I want to override, and then change just the small things that I want to override. 
Um, and then I extend, I have to override um, <laughs> to do actually check. So is this an unpublished entity? So presumably for, for nodes or something that has a published status, you don't want to actually make it viewable if the, because the person might not have access because it's unpublished or they might not have access because they don't have access but it is published. So that's a to-do to actually make it uh, a little bit uh, better because in this case they would actually, you could view unpublished stuff. And the other thing that get entities to view, gosh, I don't remember why I did that. I referring item. Yeah, because the get entities to view, they would actually say, don't get the entities that are that the person doesn't have access to. Where I just want to get all the entities, and then in my view view elements, I'm going to say make some links, make some not links. Um, but if we looked at the parent class, it actually has a whole. It has a few more methods that I basically don't need to override because. I want it to behave the same as this other formatter does, except for a few small things. Any questions on that? What is my time to? Okay. All right. Okay, so we're going to look at, um, so implementing a plugin, usually what I do is if it's a formatter or a widget, I find a similar plugin, you know, can I extend it? Is this basically, do I want all the functionality plus something? Or do I want all the functionality, but part of the functionality is tweaked a little bit? If I can't extend it, I would look at its parent. So in the case of the um, entity reference label formatter, if I didn't, if I figured it's far enough away from the label that I don't want to extend it, there's actually like an entity reference um, base format or something where the um, rendered entity, the label, and I forget another one, the ID, they all extend from this base formatter. So I might want to go up to the parent above the format I'm currently looking at and seeing if I want to extend that one or maybe one of the siblings. Um, and also like investigate the, the interfaces. So see what interfaces it implements, and see what other classes implement that. So, yeah, so this is a case where I'm just entering, okay, any reference formatter. Let me just go through there and show that. So if I open, uh, yeah, the text is really small here. So I'm going to play with fire and actually try to change my letter. Okay, so in PHP Storm, I can, unless it's still in I can just say, I can just start typing entity reference formatter. And it's going to show me all of the formatters related to entity reference. You know, if it's named correctly, I could go to the base class here and then once I'm on the base class, I could go up to navigate type hierarchy and it's going to show me all of the formatters for the various ones for any reference. We can see or hear that we have that author formatter. So basically I was saying that author behaves the way that my new module does as far as lets you see entities that you can't, lets you see the, the non-linked labels of ones you actually can't see. So that's where I got the idea for the entity reference no label. Um, there's a hidden, oh, that, that's mine, hidden, hidden author formatter is also one I was thinking of. Um, any reference label author, and then it shows the one that I extended here. Um, and if I want to go further up on the formatter base, the any reference formatter base, I can go to formatter base, and then at this point, I can probably, if I go to type hierarchy, it's going to show me all the field formatters on the site. Which I find easier than in Drupal 7, I would say, okay, I'm going to have to look at all the implementations of a particular, I forget what it was in, in Drupal 7, like hook um, field widget info or something like that to figure out what all the um, widgets were. 
Any questions? All right. Other ideas for anybody have questions for extending field plugins as far as formatters or widgets or something like that? One use case that I find this really easy is if you have some sort of like um, JavaScript, say, widget that you want to integrate, say, file uploads. Like I know Drop Zone JS does this, is you would then extend like the file widget and then just load the library of this external. Um, JavaScript widget that maybe does nice file uploads or something that you want. Um, so let's look at condition plugins. So, yeah. Uh, I was just going to say something that really blew my mind for creativity was uh, Drupal Commerce uses field formatters to insert a form in into the content. Yeah. So comments. And I, I never thought of that. Yeah. Until I saw that. that well, yeah. You could do. You can insert almost anything you want. Yeah. Formatter. Yeah. You don't just think about formatting the output of this particular field. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, I think comments does that in core too. So if you say I want to add a comment, it actually adds the form um, that would then submit your comment. So yeah. Um, so you could do that, and maybe you could change the formatter for the comment one. You could, if you have something like, well, I just want to have some sort of like reaction widget or whatever, rather than the regular comment form or something like that. Um, so condition plugins are sort of unified under Drupal 8. Um, they basically evaluate to true or false, and Drupal core uses them for block visibility, so this block should show up or this block should not show up. But also in um, panels and rules also use condition plugins. So this is something that's nice, whereas in Drupal 7 we had conditions in panels, in rules, in contexts. Um, and then we have visibility rules in core, and they all used a different condition system. So if you had, uh, we didn't really have the idea in Drupal 7 of uh, a module that only implements a condition that could be used in many places. You could actually have a module that added conditions for rules, but then you don't get that advantage over in panels or you don't get it, the advantage in core. Whereas um, with condition plugins in Drupal 8, since it's all unified, um, you could add a condition plugin. Um, so the example I'm going to show, for my example, then it will be used everywhere. So my example is author conditions. So basically, we're just looking at a condition that the node author has certain roles. And I'm extending the user role condition that we already have in core. So in core, on the blocks, you have you know show this block when the user has certain roles. But what that means is when the user viewing it has certain roles. So I'm going to add a condition that says, show this block when the author of the node that you're looking at has certain roles. So maybe um, we have premium authors that have a certain role, and we want some extra bling stuff from their account over on the right, um, because that's what they're paying for. Um, so no hooks in this example. So let's look at the code. Um, and I named this one, I think, yeah, just condition authors is the name. Modules, author conditions. Okay, so we just have one plugin, author role condition. And again, it just extends the user role because basically I want the same exact form as far as the ability to um, select conditions and then have the condition, the role save with that condition. I just, when I evaluate it, I'm going to evaluate it in a different way. Um, so the two things I had to override here is the evaluate, which is basically my last line is almost exactly the same as the parent, except before that line I go out and tell it, uh, get the context value node. So let's look at, so this is where um, annotations work in plugins, is that we have as part of our annotation to say, this needs the context node. So basically, this will not take effect if we're not on the node page. Or the block will show up if we're not on a node page. So, I go down to my evaluate and I say, get the context node, then get the entity that's attached to the UID field, which the UID field is the author. Um, 
then I take the author here and I basically just copy the last line from its parent but I just sub out instead of the user from the user who signed in I, I sub the author and I say if the roles intersect then yes this is true show the block um, so this is an example where if you have a condition that you basically just want to extend but change it very slightly then you end up writing less code and the code that you do write you're pretty much copying from core so you know hopefully you have some confidence in it and the other thing I had to change was the get cache context because of course if your condition is based on the users logged in you want to cache that based on the user whereas I don't want to cache that based on the user so I have to actually I went up to the parent uh, I guess the grandparent the parent of user role and grab the default get cache context here um, so very little sort of very little code for actually being able to you know add pretty I'd say pretty powerful functionality that now can be used in panels could could be used in yeah Would your example yeah yeah no well not not by default if you if you had panels you could if you were using panels to display fields then you could use condition plugins to say only show this field if because it's because that's the other thing is that panels is using the same condition system in the same context for conditions so this would um, as far as I know this condition would only be available if panels knows of a node so that's the other advantage of not just that we have conditions is that we have conditions and we have context so also rules potentially I don't know rules at all in Drupal 8 but potentially rules would also say well I'm only going to give you this potential condition if the thing that we're applying the rule to is a node or if I know of a node um, so that's another really nice thing about it being unified, across, uh, being something that's in core that now Contrib is using, as opposed to Contrib all making their separate solutions. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty simple one here. Um, the other thing you could do is you could say, well, instead of going off author, if it's a particular site where it's your site where you know you have a particular field, you could actually say only show this block say if an entity reference that goes to a user has a particular role or something like that. Um, questions about that? Yeah. Uh, is there any way to, I don't even know what to call it, to do plug in discovery to know not, not like what methods are implementable in a plugin, but what plugins can be created? There's a foreign plugin, there's a. Oh, plugin. yeah, so sort of. Uh, so if I go to the user role plugin, so basically just go up the chain. So I'll go to user role plugin, then condition base plugin, and then to executable base plugin, and then content aware plugin, and then go to plugin, then plugin base. So basically, I could go from the hierarchy here from plugin base, navigate down in the type hierarchy. And so, so obvious now that you showed. Yeah, so I can go down. And it's like, oh, I have, uh, I have llama plugin. I wonder who put that in. Um, I have editor plugins, Drupal image cache plugins. Uh, so actually, there aren't many base. Oh, so there's a lot. Say plugin probably. Base has a lot of plugins. Yeah. yeah. Plugin. Plugin base. There's a core plugin base too. Down from where you're selecting. Uh, one more. Oh, down. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. A plugin base here. Oh, there they are. Yeah. So they were a lot here. So yeah, basically in the same for. So and a lot of times the plugins is you, you don't necessarily want to go all the way up, but you say okay, I have a, I'm dealing with a field formatter, a particular field formatter. I kind of want to know what other formatters I have in my site. So a lot oftentimes you're not going all the way up, or going part way up, and then going back down. Um, Whereas this, yeah, if you want to say, like, what else does Drupal 8 use plugins for, you just go all the way up the chain and then go back down the chain. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think I'm at the questions board. Any, question, any other questions? Yes. Um, so you showed the hook system to alter the base field yeah. definitions. Yeah. Is there, so there's, like, a bunch of other functions that are content or methods that are content is there a way to sort of plug in your own 
class provider or like swap out no PHP? Or yeah, provider? yeah, you can do that in. So I forget what the hook is, but basically anything that has an annotation, there's a corresponding, I think it's hook entity info alter, yeah. that then you have that, what comes back from that annotation, and anything that's in that annotation, but that's not where you would change the class. Hook entity type alter. Hook entity type alter. Um, so, so basically what I would do in that case is once you find that hook, just dump out whatever's coming in for, say, node or whatever, and say, oh, here's something that says class, and it points to uh, the node entity class, and then swap out your other one. If there is special logic, you have, say, maybe, you know, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this on most sites, but maybe you have something really special that needs to happen on pre-save that you want to happen across maybe a lot of sites that you want to swap the same thing out in. Because technically, you could still do a lot of that stuff in the books if you wanted to, and it's probably best, like, I don't know if there's a pre-save hook. There probably is a pre-save hook. Yeah. So technically, in my example of do something in pre-save, you could do that in hooks. So probably most things you could do, you could all in, instead of swapping out the class, you could do it in, in corresponding hooks. So, I mean, if, but if you're swapping out a class to subclass that extends that yeah. original class anyway, yeah, then you're then calling the parent method. Like, yeah. The, the, for example, if I find myself implementing like ten yeah. entity alter hooks. Yeah. So the problem with that is, I, I did that in uh, block visibility groups for like the block listing thing. The problem is only one module can do that, whereas any number of modules can implement the hook. But if it's your custom code, and you sort of know that limitation going in, and saying like this is something we just, this is like an institutional thing that we want, and no matter, the other hooks will still fire, it's just nobody else has that access to swap out that particular class. So I need to add conditions implementation to a contributed module. Yeah. Um, uh, what's a good, where's a good place to look for example code? Be your, your, your block visibility groups or something in core? So block visibility groups doesn't actually, only has one condition. So you want to add new conditions? No, I want to, I want to add the ability to evaluate and respond to conditions. Oh. oh, like you want to do something like block visibility groups where you, yeah. Block visibility groups is a good one as far as like, okay, this one evaluates. It's probably one of the simpler ones. There's a lot of them that do it, but um, most of the ones that do it like rules or page managers or panels are just, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's happening, whereas block visibility group, that's almost the only thing that's happening. It's, so, a, it's a great example. So that's probably he, he wrote it, so he's not taking credit. <laughs> <laughs> just because it's so, it's very simple. Um, whereas it doesn't have a whole lot of other stuff going on. Do you have that, you have that in, in a specific class that will be easy to find? Okay. What's that? Can, can you show me after where it is? Uh, that's just block visibility groups if you, um, for Drupal, if you yeah, Google that. Yeah, I have the module, I just want to... Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can show you the box, yeah, okay. yeah. Any other questions? I think we're up on time. Four minutes. Four minutes. Questions, anecdotes? All right, I'll give you four minutes back to your day. All right, thanks for coming.